Last decade, absolutely. But honestly, we have been there now for a year and a half. Uh, what's going on in Gaza is unfortunate and it's awful. But it hasn't been since the 70s that something that happens between the Palestinians and the Israelis has had any impact on any meaningful markets. Uh, obviously, that was OPEC and that was the energy sector. But this is a region that does not produce or consume much or transit really anything. So it makes great headlines and it involves the United States from any number of cultural angles, but it's not an economic issue. The issue is and always has been Ukraine because we've got a country that has nukes that is dying here. And on their way out the door, the capacity of the Russian system to do immense damage is very, very real. So interesting uh, to get, you know, your thoughts that you don't feel the, the economic burden will be so big. I mean, what about food and, and, and the impact on supply chains and energy? I mean, won't those repercussions be felt, Peter? Every single one of those is true for Ukraine. Russia is the world's largest oil exporter, the world's largest natural gas producer, uh, the world's largest wheat exporter. Ukraine is the world's fifth largest wheat exporter. It's the largest exporter of oil seeds. All of that holds for Ukraine. Israel is a tech-based economy with under 7 million people. And Palest the Palestinian areas that are in question here, Gaza is an open-air prison with nothing of economic value. One of these matters much more Peter, than Peter, I mean... I, you know, you did a real in-depth um, video on your YouTube channel, which I invite everyone to watch, where you kind of do a rapid-fire Q&A. But I want to talk about some of the main points you, you brought up. Um, of mainly, you say, or you explain, you give your, you know, viewpoint on how Israel may have missed this. I mean, you say that their security, their intel is, you know, one of the gold standards in the world. Um, so if you could share a little bit with our audience of, how they, how they missed this. <laughs> well, we're, we're talking about guesswork here because the post-mortem hasn't yet been done, but this clearly should not have happened. Every cell phone, every text message that is sent in the, the Palestinian territories goes through Israeli cell towers. Their power grid is provided with fuel that is provided by the Israelis, same with their food distribution system. And the Israelis really only have two security concerns. Number one is Iran, and the number two is Gaza, and they border Gaza. So every focus that the Israelis should have had should have been on this little speck of territory, and they missed everything. We're talking about hundreds of fighters who coordinated efforts down to the tactical level from a half a dozen approaches, and yet somehow none of this information percolated up. Now, we, we can make guesses. We can talk about the general incompetence of the current government. That's a reasonable decision to, or discussion to have. We can talk about how the prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has spent the last 10 years fighting the culture war rather than dealing with actual security issues. But at this point, all we know is that they failed utterly, and that means any military operation that has started in the last week is starting with next to no intelligence to guide it. And that suggests that the next few weeks are going to be pretty brutal, no matter how anything else goes down. You talk about the potential of a toppling of the Israeli government. Yeah, I think that's kind of a foregone conclusion at this point. Um, the Netanyahu government is not supported by the normal left versus right versus center coalitions that have dominated Israeli governments for the last 60 years. Instead, it's entirely focused on the religious right, people with very little experience in the real world, much less in government, much less in security. Uh, they were able to get the votes because there's a different sort of political economy in the Israeli system compared to most of the other Western nations where you're going to have a lot more from business. Uh, you basically have a large chunk of the population who studies the Torah and as a result hasn't really had any sort of real life education or expertise. And people representing those voters are the dominant bloc within the government coalition right now. And that's made it easy for someone on the outside to say, you know, this, this is not the mix of things that give you a broad spectrum competent government. And I am afraid that we have seen very, very decisively where that leads. Peter, I want to get back to your point about how, about the economic impact, the political impact. I mean, for now, but what if this extends to Iran, Saudi Arabia? I mean, the U.S. is already involved. Egypt, Lebanon. I mean, I've had guests on here talking about World War III. No. 
No, 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 no. Let's talk, let's go through and knock these off one after the other. Egypt is an ally, and the Egyptians have actually sealed the border with Gaza for most of the time since Saturday. They loathe the Palestinians, and if you remember, Egypt used to control the West Bank between roughly 1949 and 1973. There's no love lost there. Lebanon is a borderline failed state. And even if Hezbollah were to launch an attack, Hezbollah doesn't have an army. It also doesn't have an economy. So if Lebanon were to fall off the face of the earth tomorrow, from an economic point of view, the issues would be minor. Syria is in a civil war. They're not a concern. Jordan is a satellite that lives on aid, a lot of which is funneled through Israel. So for all of the immediate neighbors, there's really no economic question there to, to even ask. Uh, Iran is a possibility, but the Iranians think of the Palestinians, especially of Hamas, as a disposable asset. Remember that the Iranians are ethnically Persian and religiously Shia versus Hamas, which is ethnically Arab and religiously Sunni. The Iranians see the Palestinians as, at best, apostates. And so there's not as much of a link there as you might think. And even if I'm wrong, and even if the Iranians do get involved, over the course of the last 10 years, Iran's oil exports have dropped precipitously. They only produce about a million barrels a day now. I'm not suggesting that if that vanished from the market, we wouldn't feel it. But that's the kind of thing that the system can get along without. The one that matters, the one you brought up, more than everything else put together by a factor of 10, is Saudi Arabia. When the Saudis had an issue with the Palestinians back in the 70s, they created what we now know today as OPEC. And there is an open question of the degree to which the Saudi royal family is going to get involved in this. But it's probably not from the angle that most people think. There's a generational split in Saudi Arabia. You've got the king's generation, King Salman, who thinks the Palestinian cause is worth fighting for. And then you've got the younger generation, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, who just thinks of them as a historical aberration that should not hold down the Saudis at all. Mohammed bin Salman, who will be the next king, wants to just throw the Palestinians on the, under the bus. And the whole idea of a peace treaty between Israel and Saudi Arabia is his idea. So we're going to find out which generation is actually holding the cards in this relationship. And that's going to be very instructive. If I was a betting man, I would say that by the end of this calendar year, the Saudis will have, in essence, declared neutrality, and the talks between Jerusalem and Riyadh will pick up again. Let's just play out if Iran was involved in the attack. What were they looking to gain? Anything that would sabotage the talks between Saudi Arabia and Israel, the, the Iranians would see as a plus. Under the Trump administration, Morocco and the United Arab Emirates both basically joined the Egyptians in recognizing the existence of the state of Israel. And if the Saudis were to join that coalition, you can pretty much guarantee that all the other Arab countries in one way or another would follow suit within the next few years. And then you're talking about a very different Middle East. If you've got all the Sunni Muslims with the vast, vast majority of the area's population and economy all on one side facing down Iran, then it doesn't really matter what the United States does because Iran has been the odd man out, much poorer than the others, uh, and isolated diplomatically and economically. Anything that the Iranians can do to throw a spanner into those talks was a plus. I know we're talking about a lot of hypotheticals here, but if Donald Trump returns to office, how does this change, does this change the course of anything? Um, well, two things. Number one, Donald Trump is going to win the nomination but lose the general. That's a whole different topic we can go into. But hypothetically, if he were to come back, um, you know those bang snap firecrackers you had as a kid that you just kind of throw them on the ground and makes people jump? Trump in the Middle East yes. is basically throwing handfuls of that every five minutes. Uh, that doesn't mean he doesn't have an impact. It means he doesn't have an organized impact. And this area is in the process of beating to it or moving to its own drum as opposed to what the United States wants. Remember, love it or hate it, under Trump and Biden, we have withdrawn almost all of our forces from the region. And if you don't have forces in the Middle East, you can't manipulate it very well. Peter, I'm, 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 I'm a little surprised. Okay, let's, let's go there because you brought it up. You think he <laughs> wouldn't win the election because what I'm hearing after what's happened in the Middle East, and you know, it started with talk 
when Russia invaded Ukraine. But now it's like the victory is sealed for Trump. Well, he will definitely win the nomination. Uh, if everyone on the Republican field were to consolidate behind a single player now, I think Trump would still win, even from prison. Uh, his, his hold on the base is just too powerful. We, we've seen two things go down in the Republican Party, one that guarantees that Trump will win the nomination, one that guarantees he will lose the general. Uh, first, he has mobilized a new group of voters, the populace, with based on whoever's numbers you're using, are generally accepted now to be the single largest voting bloc in the country. And they are his people, and they will show up to primaries if he asks them to. And so the nomination's in the bag. But he has driven away fiscal voters and military voters and business community and law and order voters, which means that he can't possibly win the general election. The reason that Republicans have done so well these past 45 years is they've had a coalition that hasn't fight, fought among themselves. But what Trump has done is he's triggered infighting. And his coalition just doesn't have the numbers if that infighting is happening. This is usually a problem that the Democrats have. Usually they have more numbers, but more infighting. Now Trump has created a coalition that has fewer numbers and infighting. And the numbers just aren't there. God forbid the independents show up because we saw in the midterms that they don't care for Trump very much. And if they did that at the midterms, you can pretty much guarantee they're gonna show up at the general. So RFK for you? Um, <laughs> well, uh, I think the technical term is waste of skin, uh, but in case of the general election, him running as an independent will split the batshit crazy vote, which is certainly going to help the Biden team win re-election. Okay, interesting. Um, I wanted to bring this up with you. Let's talk a little bit about, you kind of went there, mainstream media coverage of the Middle East war, of terrorism in general. So mm -hmm. one thing I had been thinking about, Peter, is where was talk of terrorism during COVID? Did all terrorists just take a sabbatical and say, you know what, we're going to chill out right now? So I went to Statista and looked at number of fatalities due to terrorist attacks. So the height, yes, 2018. But there were still terrorist attacks in 2020, 2021. Now, you may argue, well, they weren't in countries that counted, right? But there was still full-on terrorism. Do you, what I'm trying to discuss with you here is the focus on terrorism in, in media. And would you not agree there was not much talk about terrorism in Syria, Afghanistan, et cetera, during those COVID years? Uh, what we're seeing around the world from maybe seven years ago, and what we're going to see for probably another decade, is as the United States reduces its overall position in the world for various reasons, you're going to have a lot of governments that just don't make it. There are a lot of places that the United States has propped up for security reasons. Afghanistan is probably at the very top of that list. And when the United States steps back or when demographic trends break or when trade issues shift, a lot of countries lose some coherence. And in that sort of environment, you get battles to see who ultimately will inherit the pieces. Based on where you are politically, you might define some of those as terrorist. And I think that's a fair assessment. The more discomfort and breakdown we have in the world, the more we're going to have people struggling over what is left over. And as you've pointed out, places that don't matter have more of this from our point of view. We're going to see a lot more of that. And that means places like Syria and Lebanon and Afghanistan and to a certain degree Pakistan and India are going to see more of this sort of activity as the center can't hold on to all of the peripheries. That's kind of hardwired in at this point. Now, the reason we haven't discussed that is because most of the places we care about, that hasn't happened to them yet. In fact, if you look at the first mm -hmm. world, the only one where that center hasn't held so far is Greece. That means the security issue to this point right. has been quite manageable. That doesn't mean that's how it's going to continue, though. Well, I mean... You know, if I again in New York City, there was a day of you know around the world really, but there was just such heightened security on Friday because of this day of of, of, of jihad, right? So mm -hmm. the rise of, uh, of of terrorist activities around the world because of this, Peter, is that a concern for you? Uh, 
Increasing terror activity around the world would be a concern? Absolutely. Increasing terrorist activity here? Not so much. Uh, as a rule, when you're fighting over what's left of a system, all of your fights are at home or close to it. So the Kashmiris are concerned with the Indians, the Palestinians are concerned with the Israelis, and so on. Doing a Hail Mary into a different hemisphere to launch an attack doesn't help with local control. You only do that if you're an ideologue and you're trying to get the United States to do something differently. And for Hamas, that doesn't even make the top 10 list. Uh, Peter, since it's our, our, our first time speaking, I'm curious to get your thoughts on, on the rise of the BRICS. I mean, we're talking about misfit countries. And here's a group of countries that, you know, we're not usually invited to the lunch table, but now they're all sitting <laughs> at the same table. Let's get, let's get your thoughts on the BRICS. Is it just a lot of hocus pocus nonsense talk or do you think they're gonna be a force to be reckoned with? Well, let me answer your, well, actually I can answer both of those, no problem. So number one, this, there's nothing going on yet. Uh, in fact, when the South Africa summit happened, the South Africans, the Indians and the Chinese all said publicly they had no interest in a BRIC currency, they were fine with the dollar. Now, that was missed in the United States because it doesn't match the narrative of this discussion of de-dollarization, which, to be perfectly honest, is not happening. The U.S. dollar is used more in transactions now than ever before. Uh, the, the drop in first world currencies and global trade and currency reserves hasn't been the dollar. It's been the euro. That's what happens when you confiscate insured bank deposits to pay for bailouts. Just FYI, that was a bad move. Uh, so, No. And there was this lovely discussion between the Indians and the Russians where they were arguing over what currency their trade should be in. And the Russians basically said, I don't want your rubles, or sorry, I don't want your rupees. And the Indians said, I don't want your rubles. And that was the end of the conversation. So that really is going absolutely nowhere outside of the financial papers in the United States. What about talk of a common currency that they're developing, one backed by gold? Yeah. Uh, there isn't enough gold on the planet, and the Chinese, the South African Indians, have no interest in it. They've said so publicly. And the Russians, to be very clear, don't want a gold-backed currency. They just want everyone to use the ruble. So you think that they'll never come to like a common, a common front? No, there, there is no constellation of economic forces that all of them subscribe to. I mean, they all obviously have significant trading relationships with the Chinese, but the Chinese manipulate their currency vociferously in order to achieve economic and political gains. So no one wants to use the yuan. Okay. In fact, the Chinese don't want to use the yuan. Well, let, let's talk China here. Um, sure. Because I watched your, an interview you did with, with Joe Rogan um, where you said you believe China's collapse is imminent with only 10 years remaining before potential disaster. And correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of your thesis is tied to the fact you think they're lying about their population. That's much less well, than Well, I reported. don't think they're lying about the, the, their population. In the last three months, they've come out and said that their data was wrong. In fact, over the course of the last three months, they've updated a lot of their data, and they're now admitting publicly that their birth rate has dropped by 70% in just the last five years, which is the sharpest decline of any ethnic group in any era in human history. And the Shanghai Academies of Sciences is saying that even this new update is probably wrong, and they've probably overcounted their population by more than 100 million people. So the, the scope of the downward slide here is just immense. So it's, you know, it's interesting because before uh, the outbreak of the war in the Middle East, what were we talking about, Peter? We were talking about potential war between USA and, and China. So uh, what happens to that narrative? I don't want to rule out the possibility of a conflict. I would just say that we don't know. Uh, Xi has, Chairman Xi has sequestered himself, and he's built such a tight cult of personality that even basic information is not percolating up to the top. So he is broadly unaware of the country of which he is ruling now. We've seen a lot of statistics disappear as a result because the people in the bureaucracy think that making this stuff go away is what Xi wants. Uh, this is how he 
basically made due diligence functionally illegal in the country. This is why COVID data isn't even collected anymore. This is why consumer confidence data isn't collected. So predicting what Xi personally will do now has become a bit of a fool's errand because we don't even know what basic information he's coming out. So, you know, you, you talk about the battlefield in Ukraine or you talk about wheat prices and you can see how that might influence Vladimir Putin's decision making. But the information isn't making it to Xi. And so we don't know what sort of sea of information he's even operating in, which makes it almost impossible to figure out what he might do. What I can say is when you have this degree of breakdown in information flows, military decision making kind of goes in the crapper as well. Peter, just to wrap here, as I mentioned at the start, you're a keynote speaker at the Stansbury Alliance conference in Vegas. It's a room full of investors. I mean, what's your message there? <laughs> We're going through the greatest period of economic change in everybody's lives. I mean, this is what's going on right now with the breakdown of globalization, with demographic flips, with what's going on with the Chinese situation. Now, we haven't seen these sort of shocks since a minimum mm. World War II. And what's different about this and why it's probably in the end going to be much more dramatic than what we've seen is the population structures have shifted. After 70 years of industrialization, we've had fewer and fewer and fewer kids on the world as a whole. And a lot of advanced countries, Germany, Korea, Taiwan, China, are going to have so many retirees that they can't function as modern systems because they don't have the young people for consumption or the middle-aged folks for production. This, this all ends this decade. And that changes financial structures. That changes how we manufacture. That changes how we consume. And we don't have a model at the moment for what it looks like on the other side of this. What I can tell you for sure is that the United States has more time than everyone else because whatever you wanna say about the baby boomers, and there's a lot we can say, they did one thing that their cohorts, their peers, and the rest of the world didn't do. They had kids. And so we've got the millennials and they will, they will save us all. Wow. That's putting a lot of faith in, in, in the millennials, Peter. But I guess it ties in to my opening comments about, uh, you know, Jamie Dimon's latest, because, you know, whether you agree with him or not, uh, I think it, there's, it's, it's still a, a, a dire warning and it warrants a new way of thinking uh, that investors have to wake up to. Um, so, I mean, one, like, let's just leave it like with this, like one takeaway, wait, how should investors be repositioning themselves? What should they be thinking about at night? Is there anything they can do to be better prepared for these changing demographics and times? Sure. I will never tell people that they should not pay attention to security issues. They have become elevated. They will remain elevated for at least a decade. I agree with Diamond on that completely. However, these changes in population structures, are draining the system of capital. We have not, in the next five years, we're gonna have a capital system where capital is so scarce and so expensive that we have nothing in living memory to compare it to. And if you are in an environment where you have capital in that world, wow, you're gonna feel really important because you I mean, everyone's curious, but it doesn't get to the core of what I normally do, but there's plenty of other things going on. So. Uh, well, maybe we can touch on those, but I know what we have a, I have you for a very short amount of time. So I want to dive right in. Sure. And, um, but first I want to make sure that everybody knows to follow you on social channels and subscribe to your YouTube because you walking around anywhere, whether it's Colorado or anywhere around the world and just like pausing and sometimes not even pausing, continuing to walk, <laughs> talking about these, these global, you know, geopolitical issues uh, with such I get, ease might be the wrong word, but with such clarity uh, and conviction, the same way that you write. But as you're like just hiking through like the tundra or something, is uh, <laughs> it's remarkable. So everybody should sign up for those and watch those whenever you drop them. Do you have a deer headgear chandelier behind you? <laughs> there it is. I am in a semi-undisclosed location writing, so this is not my, uh, is very my house. Utah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. We do have one in our house as well, though, uh, it, and it is very, uh, very. Well, you're in Colorado. You see my this sort of thing. Yeah. No, I just I haven't been in the house long enough to be able to convince that uh, convince myself that this is not necessary to happen. But I'm close. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll have to send you one. Uh, but uh, 
I wanted to talk to you, obviously, about what's going on in uh, in Israel, Hamas, uh, how that ties in more globally with Hezbollah, Iran, possibly Russia, and the United States response. Um, so, what were some of your initial what were some of your initial thoughts when you first heard of the attacks on Saturday? Well, the, the single biggest deal is that uh, this should have been detected. Uh, Hamas is the group that the Israelis are most concerned about monitoring. And in theory, they have them shot through with plenty of human intelligence gathering operations. And of course, it's right on their borders. So signals intelligence should be pretty good. And the idea that you could have conservatively 500 Hamas fire fighters, probably close to a thousand cross the border in a surprise assault that from 20 different vectors using a half a dozen different transport methods and none of it was detected before it went down. That is an intelligence failure that is just colossal. This isn't like 9-11 where it was some fringe group using a novel method of attack. These are all known factors. And for the Israelis to miss this, I mean, at a, at a minimum, this is going to cause the downfall of the government, which a lot of people probably think is not all that bad of a thing. Uh, but it's definitely going to cause a complete top to bottom over hall of how the Israelis do everything, just like it did the last time something like this went down 50 years ago when the Israelis reformed their intelligence systems in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War and became the world standard. So somehow, somewhere in the last 20 years, it's all fallen apart. And it makes you wonder what else they're missing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some parallels to us after the, the Cold War relying more on uh, signals type intelligence, technical type intelligence, rather than human type intelligence. That, right. and, uh, and there's pros right. and cons of each method, but the foes that the United States is primarily concerned about are in a different hemisphere. So you can understand why signals intelligence forms a, a stronger pillar for us. Gaza was right there. Yeah. And, and I mean, I don't know if you've... Uh, felt this way or, or not, or if this is your assessment or not, that the uh, Israeli intelligence services in particular had a kind of aura of not invincibility, but a uh, outreach, a mystery, Absolutely. a mystique. Uh, that they were embedded in Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran through agents, spies, proxy groups even, that uh, has been shattered perhaps with this uh, latest incursion. I mean, again, we don't have any information. The most logical conclusion today, which might be proven wrong tomorrow, is that it's a new faction within Hamas because there's, there's dozens of them. And it could just be a new one that popped up and somehow managed to recruit several hundred people. Mm -hmm. Even that doesn't hold together very well. Yeah. And uh, so more geopolitically, when we talk about U.S., Israel and Saudi uh, and uh, an agreement that I don't know on the brink is the right word, but uh, or the right terminology, but working through normalization of relations uh, in exchange for possibly increased oil production and uh, decreased oil prices and maybe some military support also for Saudi and a kind of a reorganization of the order in the Middle East. Um, how much did that play into what happened? over the weekend if i was a guessing man i would say that that was the primary rationale for the timing if not the attack itself uh definitely for the brutality as well uh, you're looking at things that hamas has now done in the last week that even isis never got around to doing in terms of just the human denigration uh and so it's going to be very very difficult for the folks in riyadh to still proceed to cut a deal with israel now for those of you who don't like live and breathe this area quick quick primer uh, there are lots and lots and lots of factions across the Middle East, but there's really four that matter. You've got the Turks, different ethnicity, but Sunni Muslim, semi-secular. You've got the Sunnis, which Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Egypt, that's the dominant group, Sunni Arabs. The third group are the Israelis, the Jews, and then the fourth are Shia Persian, so different religious sect, different ethnicity, and that's Iran. And what has been going on for the last, let's call it a decade, uh, but really intensely started in the second year of the Trump administration, was a normalization of, pro of the relationship between the second and the third factions, the Sunni Arabs that make up the, the vast majority and the vast majority of the economy, and then the Jews who have the technology and the relationship with the United States. And the idea was that if you can get those two factions on the same side, then the rest of the Middle East will more or less take care of itself. Now, there are any number of ways that you can manage the Middle East. This is one. I'm not saying it's better or worse than anyone, than any particular one, but this is the one that the Biden and the Trump administrations broadly agreed on, 
behind closed doors. They will never say that out loud, but it's, it's a by administration strategy. Uh, and the United Arab Emirates and Morocco have already gone down that path. And the question was whether Saudi Arabia, the biggest, the most powerful, the richest of the Sunni states would follow. And within Riyadh, there is a familial argument. I mean, we, we all know about those intergenerational arguments we have at family reunions, where all the aunts and the uncles and the parents are on one side and all the cousins and the kids are on the other side. And it doesn't matter how old you are, those arguments really don't change. Well, for the older generation, the defining characteristics of the Arab identity is that the Palestinians are Arabs too. And so any sort of deal that is struck with anyone has to at least pay homage to the idea that the Palestinians should be able to control their own territory. But the next generation down, led by Mohammed bin, or Mohammed bin Salman, excuse me, uh, who's a millennial, is like, yeah, whatever, that's your problem, old man. Uh, the Palestinians have never done anything for us. Uh, Gaza is an open air prison camp. Even if we wanted to do something with it, we couldn't with all of our money. So just let it rot and let's cut a deal with the power that matters, and that's Israel. And that will usher in a new Middle East where we lead the entire Arab world against Iran. Now that might be a little over optimistic, but it's not ridiculous. So what's going on in Riyadh right now is the older generation, which includes the king, and the younger generation, which includes the king apparent, mm -hmm. are fighting about it. And we will know within a month who comes out on top based on what's the Saudi position is versus Iran and Hamas, uh, TBD. Do you think that, um alliance for lack of a better term us israel saudi that uh kind of trilateral type of uh, uh relationship is uh would be beneficial to order in that part of the world uh, the word order is a little loaded uh, it would <laughs> consolidate a certain side and something to remember with all of this is these two countries started this without us uh, when we made it very clear that we weren't thrilled with the Israelis for uh, things they were doing in the occupied territories, we withdrew some military support. And we did the same for the Saudis for what they were doing in their own region. And so the Israelis and the Saudis for about 15 years now have been playing the United States are off of them each other uh, and in doing so have gotten more weapons and more technology and more funding that we than we would have normally generated with the israelis providing military training for the saudis and the saudis providing intelligence on iran for the israelis they already have de facto a fairly robust bilateral relationship the question is whether the united states feels it needs to have an active role in that so our role in these talks have mostly been hand-holding this isn't like discussions between us and the Iranians where we don't meet directly and the Swiss have to run back and forth with messages. We're kind of the third wheel here. Interesting. And then when we talk about, let, let's look at another uh, kind of uh, trilateral relationship, uh, Russia, Iran, China. What, <laughs> is, uh, what does that look like? Well, let, let's start with the bigger two players. The Chinese and the Russians do not like one another. Uh, it's an alliance of convenience. And the standing Russian position is that the Chinese ever cross the border into Siberia, that the Russians won't meet them with tanks and troops. They'll just nuke them. Hmm. Uh, and when that is kind of like the basis of the relationship, you can imagine how much trust there is. Uh, they don't like each other. It's a marriage of convenience at the time. The Chinese really, really, really are enjoying the stalemate that has erupted in the Ukraine war because it means everybody's eyes are over there rather than on China. Uh, and that's convenient. And it's in many ways the flip of what the Russian position was when the Americans were facing off against the Chinese during the Trump administration. They were like, hey, this is great. We can start moving things into play to grab territory we want while the Americans are focused over there. So there is absolutely no love lost. Alliance of convenience. That doesn't mean irrelevant. It's just if circumstances evolve, they will stab each other in the back in seconds. Uh, Iran is doesn't get along with either the Russians or the Chinese nearly as well as they get along with one another. Uh, the Iranians look down on the Chinese as an inferior society. The feeling is mutual. And the Russians and the Iranians have fought any number of wars over the Caucasus. And whenever Azerbaijan uh, decides to get a little uppity, the Iranians get really pissed off. Because for the Russians, the Azerbaijanis are not a threat. They're small, they're remote, there's some arguments over energy transport policy, but nothing really that cuts to the core of Moscow's interests. 
but the single largest minority in Azerbaijan, or excuse me, the single largest minority in Iran are Azerbaijanis. And so mm -hmm. the very existence of an independent Azerbaijan, Iran sees as a threat. And now that the Russians are pulling out of the Caucasus and Azerbaijan is taking the fight to Armenia, for Russia, they always knew they were going to sell out their Armenians. But for the Iranians, this is like the last brick in the wall breaking away to generate what they're fearing is going to be an irredentist Azerbaijan right on their doorstep with unofficial Russian blessing. Uh, mm -hmm. So any collaboration between the Russians and the Iranians is through clenched teeth. It's mm -hmm. not that the two players don't see a reason to cooperate. Uh, this area is messy. Everyone has been an ally or an enemy at one time or another, or both. Uh, but there's no love there. And the Iranians are fully aware that in the Russian eyes, at best, they're a distraction uh, mm -hmm. to be used and it's entirely possible that today, while the Russians may, may, emphasis on the word may, have had a finger in what's going on with Hamas, and that may be something that the Iranians are broadly in favor of, they'll, again, sell each other out in a second if they think they can get a better deal from the United States. Interesting. Um, I have so many questions about that Russian Russian fingers uh, involvement and the how and the why. But uh, pivoting to China, did they didn't they sign a was it a, a two years ago a twenty five year some sort of strategic partnership with with Iran? Yeah. Whenever you see the Chinese or the Russians sign a strategic partnership, that's the code word. That means it doesn't mean anything. Okay. And but but they are the are they the largest trading partner? Is it all crude oil? I don't know offhand if they're number one. If not, they're pretty close. But remember, Iran doesn't trade very much. So they've got a much slimmed down oil portfolio and they import most of their food. And that's about the end of the trading relationship. Mm. And when we look at the, the U.S. sending uh, carrier battle group, uh, possibly two, uh, into the Med as a, I think, as uh, a, a, a sign to the Lebanon, Hezbollah, Iran to uh, not come in from the north and not turn this thing into a broader conflict. Is that the point, deterrence, or is the point being there to take advantage of the opportunity to go in and hit whatever sites we've been oh, wanting to oh, let, let me be clear. If it wasn't for the hostage situation, the U.S. would have no interest in being anywhere near this. But one of the kind of the, the unofficial agreements that you make with the U.S. government, if you're a citizen, is that no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter your circumstances, no matter your crimes, we will come for you. And as soon as we know where those hostages are, we will go in hard. We will not subcontract that out to a third party. And that's why the carrier is in place. And that's the only reason the carrier is in place. Uh, people like to say, oh, this is a deterrent for Hezbollah, but we're not going to get involved in that because it's not the sort of situation that a carrier can fix. If you want to root out Hezbollah, very different circumstances from Hamas. Hamas is several thousand, several tens of thousands, several hundred thousand don't know what the number is uh, among a densely populated open air prison of three million people and going door to door to through that to clear it out even if we threw the entire u.s military at that that would not be enough for that job so i do not envy what's in front of the israelis or in front of the palestinians on that front there is no way that is going to be anything but hideous lebanon actually has terrain uh, it's mountainous, there are forests, and so it's a more traditional Afghan-style mm -hmm. operation, if you will, and we want nothing to do with that. We had 20 years of that, thank you, we're done. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, nuclear supremacy in the Middle East plays into any of this? Uh, I saw something, I think it was in the Times of Israel, with Netanyahu suggesting that uh, Saudi Arabia get some sort of Iranian enrichment program going. Do you think there's a uh, some sort of tacit agreement that, uh, with, with, that nuclear power, energy, possibly weapons are involved in uh, the Israel, U.S., Saudi side of things? Uh, not in the short term, at least. Probably not in the midterm. Uh, the, the Israelis, I don't think, have a nuclear power system. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, but they do have a couple hundred tactical nukes, which are more than enough for their strategic needs. They might, 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 might. They're very 
KG on this, have a few city flatteners just in case everyone gets too uppity. Uh, but that is, it's all designed as a last ditch. This is what we do when the last of us is going into the ocean because we've been overrun sort of play. They, they don't have a strategic doctrine for anything less than that. As for the Saudis, um, the Saudis have a lot of military stuff on paper. Uh, but it's all shrink-wrapped and stored in air-conditioned warehouses. And they only very, very recently started training on any of it themselves when they came to the conclusion that the U.S. really, really had no interest in coming to pull them out of the fire if they pick a fight with someone, including Iran. Uh, Iran, of course, has a nuclear weapons program, but has not been able to create a device, much less a deliverable weapon. And to be perfectly blunt, it's not clear that they're going to be able to. They might. They probably will be able to get enough fissile material to do it, but Iranian engineers are not world class, and they were not world class by definitions in the 1940s, much less today. So I would think that if the Iranians were ever going to get a weapon, they would have done it already. Uh, but if I'm wrong, and they are closer than I think, then I will bet my entire life that the Saudis will go to Pakistan and purchase a few nukes the next day. Uh, Saudi technical acumen is significantly below that of Iran's, but they've got a really big checkbook. And there are some people out there who have nukes who with the right number would sell and the Saudis have already set that up. So it can happen very, very quickly should they feel so pressed. But the US will have nothing to do with that. If anything, the US would, do a significant amount of things to prevent it from happening, but I don't think we could stop it. Interesting. Future of Gaza, what do you see, uh, whether it's short term, let's say two weeks to a month, uh, and then five years out? Has the, has the, uh, the paradigm changed based on the, the level of violence against civilians over the last few days? Well, let, let's start at what it was before the assaults. Uh, this was an open air prison camp. This is an area that has no economic reason to exist. It is a prison camp. Uh, and as such, there is no meaningful trade. It's dependent upon the outside world for over 90% of their food and 100% of their energy. Uh, that Those supplies either come from Israel directly as a kind of a drip feed just to keep the place quiet or international donations, and that is the entire story. So while I don't obviously do anything but vomit when I see what has happened and what Hamas has done, you have to admit when the best that you could hope for is to be mayor of a prison camp. That, that's the height of social, social and technological achievement in Gaza. You can understand why some people choose some darker paths. They'll never get back to where they were. Uh, Israel controls all but one sliver of the border, which is with it, with with Egypt, and that's where the tunnels are that allow the Palestinians to smuggle things in. At a minimum, the minimum response that we will see out of Israel is clearing out an area maybe a quarter of a half mile thick and compressing the prison even a little bit more to make sure that none of those tunnels can ever be used again. And they, these people will be completely at the mercy of whatever the Israeli political system allows. And I don't see another way out of that because the Egyptians are the only other country in play here. They're on the wrong side of the Sinai to project power here. And even if they could project power, they're not going to do it to free Gaza. Because even if the walls went away tomorrow, then it's an open air prison camp with fewer walls. Uh, there is not a future here. And now that we've seen very clearly that Hamas cannot not only not only patrol its own territory, prevent things like this from happening, but actually encourage things like this to happen. Uh, there is no administration that can go in there and fix this. Uh, so you're looking at a degree of organizational chaos if the Israelis win and do root out Hamas. And if they fail, then you're talking about a state of on again, off again, open warfare with a people that have nowhere to go. Uh, the humanitarian scale of what's about to happen is going to be horrific. Yeah. And future of Israel, when you look, I'm sorry, Israel, Iran, when you look at Iran and uh, their connections to Hamas, Hezbollah, um, what, uh, what do you see in their future, uh, whether it's short term or long term? And is it dependent on what happens here in the next couple months with Israel and Hamas and Hezbollah? Well, from our last talk, we talked a lot about China and Russia and how we're going to both outlive both of those countries. We're not going to outlive Iran. Iran's been around for a very long time. It's had good government continuity over most 
of the 4,000 plus years that it, Persia has been in existence in some form. And the ruling class isn't one person like it is in China. It's, it's a group of 10,000 mullahs. So even the world's most aggressive assassination campaign can't wipe that out. In addition, it's mountainous. So the military challenge of ever defeating Iran in any circumstance is almost impossible. That doesn't mean it's going to be a dynamic economic power. That doesn't even mean it's destined to be a long run oil exporter, but it does mean it's durable. Uh, no matter how this goes down, Iran will survive this just fine uh, in the short run. The question, of course, is in Riyadh. So the, the Iranians, I would be shocked if we don't find the information relatively soon that they helped shape this operation and help support Hamas. But again, everyone in this area has been a friend. Everyone in this area has been a foe. Hamas is Sunni and Arab, whereas Iran is Shia and Persian, and they think of each other as apostates. They are convenient allies for the moment, and from the Iranian point of view, entirely disposable. So if they can get someone that they think is an apostate to do some horrific things in order to break up the potential alliance between two other apostate groups, for them, there's no downside here. And mm -hmm. even odds, they're going to get their way. But even if they don't, they have demonstrated that they have the capacity to manipulate groups a thousand miles away in ways that no one can detect. From their point of view, there's no downside here. From their point of view, there's nothing but potential successes ahead of them. Because if they really did have a role in this, then there's no reason to expect that they can't do it again with another group that maybe is even a little bit more ideologically allied, such as Hezbollah, who are Shia. Interesting. Uh, do you think this is a pyrrhic victory for uh, for Hamas? One of they they will tout as the most successful operation in their in their history. Um, but uh, did it did it change the dynamic enough in that the gloves essentially have come off and the restraint? When you look at capability uh, of the Israeli military and what we thought of the Israeli intelligence services, the restraint that they have essentially uh, exercised over the last decade, little over a decade, um, is that a thing of the past? Yeah, probably. Um, it's difficult to crawl inside the mind of somebody who has an ISIS-like approach to the world. Mm -hmm. But it appears to be that the thinking is, is if we kill enough Israelis openly, publicly, obviously, brutally, that they will roll into Gaza. And even if we can turn it into a kill box and kill 10,000 Israeli soldiers, and even if every single one of us dies, the process of the Israelis doing that will kill so many civilians that had nothing to do with this, that the world will condemn Israel in a way that actually means something. And before you say that it's completely batshit, keep in mind that well, that was basically Osama bin Laden's approach for 9-11. You bait the United States to do something it wouldn't ordinarily do, and in doing so, trigger a region-wide uprising to overthrow the secular governments of the region. It didn't work, but that didn't stop them from doing it. Yeah, and uh, in the few minutes we have left, I wanted to ask you about something you've, you've talked about in your books, and you spoke about it recently on your, your YouTube channel, and that's the future of the U.S. Navy securing trade routes and providing essentially security for the globe post-World War II, and what that looks like going forward. Well, that's a big jump from Gaza, but sure. Okay, so the... The whole idea of globalization is it was a bribe. We, we were so scared of Stalin in the days after World War II that we knew that we needed millions of people to stand between us and the Red Army. Globalization is what we did. Uh, we used our Navy to patrol the open oceans to create global trade. And in exchange, you had to join us in the Cold War. And for the Europeans, that meant standing up and facing off against the Russians. And it worked. Uh, but the strategy that worked when we were the world's only Navy uh, has steadily faded. Uh, ever since 92, when the wall came down, we've been backing away from that security role, and we have elected a series of ever more economically nationalist presidents called Joe Biden. People forget that from an economic international point of view that Biden and Trump are the two most similar presidents we've ever had. Just one of them knows how to use a grammar checker. Uh, we're not in the 50s anymore. 
Uh, the Soviets had a Navy, but they were almost landlocked. Their, the Navy split up in four different seas. So it wasn't until after 1992 that we saw meaningful navies rise up in third powers in a degree that could potentially challenge us, with China, of course, being at the top of the list. But Jap Japan's no slouch. The Brits are back in the game. The French never went away. The Turks are, are have got some interesting stuff. And the Russians are now sharing their technology with anyone who will pay for it. India has made the board as well. So... To maintain that position would require a much more powerful naval patrolling capacity than we had back in the 1980s. And our Navy patrolling capacity is much less than it was in the 1990s, because like everybody else in 1992, we declared kind of an end to history, and we changed the way our Navy works. It used to have global reach and global operational capacity. Now we've turned it into a purely military force, which I know sounds a little weird, uh, but focused around the carrier battle groups so we can knock rogue nations off their perch. So we today have 12 of those, and all of our ships are basically committed to providing the defensive rings around the carriers. And they're the most powerful military platforms and units in human history, but we no longer have a large enough fleet in numbers to be everywhere at once like we used to be and there are challenges in most of those places so we would need probably seven or eight hundred destroyers to provide global maritime security we only have 70 and at any given time half of those are with the carriers so we're not in a position to even theoretically try so the first time someone takes a shot at a civilian vessel and we're not there that's going to unwind a whole lot of things that we've become used to. Uh, everything from electronic supply chains to global oil. Yeah, and I ask about it because of uh, if two or even three battle groups are heading two to the Med, one up maybe in the Strait of Hormuz, perhaps, um, what that means for the rest of the world and what that this means. Is, for this is more carrier activity than we've had in this part of the world in almost 20 mm -hmm. years. Uh, and that means it has to come from somewhere else. Correct. Yeah. So 10 years from now, 20 years from now, uh, these countries who have been enjoying this uh, protection of trade routes for the most part from the United States, um, how does that change the balance of trade? Oh, well, global trade will go away. It will be regional in areas where local powers can provide their own, mar yeah, their own maritime cover. Uh, the Western Hemisphere, I think, will broadly be fine, and we'll have some partners in Southeast Asia, plus Australia and New Zealand, mm -hmm. and Japan, um, a bit of a surprise from 10 years ago, is basically joining that club. So there still will be, you know, global trade, if you want to call that. It's more a series of regions that might be able to find some partnerships. But the hilarious thing is the country that has benefited the most from this globalization structure and the American security overwatch this whole time has been China. Uh, they're by far the country that's most dependent upon being able to send civilian vessels anywhere and anywhere at any time. Uh, and... And wow, they're screwing the pooch. Um, there are a lot of people who talk about the Chinese playing the long game and being very well thought out. And I'm like, no, it's a cult of personality. It's one dude making policy in a room by himself and he's doing so many stupid things. And challenging the US Navy is probably just the height of idiocy because that is the backbone for his country's economic existence, not success, existence. They import three quarters of their energy and they import three quarters of the stuff that allows them to grow their own food. And that's before you start considering the income that comes and the technology that arrives because of their play in global electronics. All that is being pissed away. That's why I love talking to you. And I know I got to let you go. If there's one thing that you uh, wish Americans would, would uh, think about, understand um, about the situation in, uh, in Israel uh, with Hamas right now, what, what is that one thing? There's no win here for anyone. So be careful who you condemn. Interesting. And is there a new book on the horizon? What do I have uh, to enjoy next? Uh, I'll be with a no book comment read them on that. No I've comment yet? I've pretty much nonstop for the last year and a half. So there hasn't been time to think about it, but I will start thinking about it next year. All right. All right. Well, keep me posted. I can't wait to, to read it, whatever it is. And uh, anyone else listening out there, be sure and follow Peter on those social channels. And